I took on a new position two weeks ago at the University of South Carolina. I am now the director of the Center for Teaching Excellence. Uh, I have a real simple job. I just have to make sure at this Research One University that all of our teaching is as good as all of the research. So, very simple thing. Uh, I got the position simply because uh, I have a passion for teaching, uh, 35 years experience, and uh, I know the technology is underlying it. So when Larry and I were talking about drivers of uh, bandwidth consumption, I naturally said, you know, let me do just a couple minutes on what's going on in education because this is going to be a big driver. And there are a lot of things, and I'm going to give you a similar format to what you had a few minutes ago. Uh, we'll go with kind of a list. Um, I sat down and said, what are the big trends in education? And just started writing and said, okay, these seven, these seven are going to be driving bandwidth and technology. First, there's distributed learning. Uh, we don't call it distance education anymore because it doesn't have to happen at a distance. Sometimes a person's in the next room. Sometimes a student uh, is just sick, and instead of coming to class, they can actually go online and attend class. Uh, what we have are uh, basically synchronous online education where someone from their computer can participate in class. Uh, I've been teaching a class for the last four years for a brand new program at USC called uh, Engineering Management. And I teach the corporate communication program. I go into what is virtually a TV studio. I have about five or six students with me and another dozen or so out watching uh, either on their computers or in classrooms in other parts of the state. Uh, you can also do it asynchronous. Uh, and you build your course completely differently. You may have lectures that a person can watch at any time, but then you have activities. Uh, the big thing is you have to look at how much time people are engaged. Uh, and at our university, we have a actual benchmarks you have to hit, how many hundred minutes in order for that course to actually be called a course. And then you have blended. So it's, the first thing is just using the technology to extend teaching. But that's just the start. Uh, second thing is learning management systems. Virtually no level of education functions now without, and I just threw a few logos up here, I could fill this with about a hundred logos. These are systems that tell students what their grades are. They're perfectly secure, they can accept assignments, they can be used to deliver assignments. When students submit assignments, you can use something called the Safe Assign feature that will scan it to see is there any plagiarism in it. It's simply a way of managing every aspect um, I use it for everything from communicating with students, sending assignments, giving assignments, but it implicates bandwidth at every step of the educational process. Uh, the flipped classroom is a, uh, a big factor. The idea of flipped classroom is simple that when you come into classroom, you don't give the lecture. That anything you would give in the lecture, the students have to consume via notes or reading before they get, and then when they get to the classroom, they do something. And again, Quite often that involves technology in that doing of something. But that gives the instructor much more opportunity for one-on-one -on -one interaction when the people are doing things. So uh, it's become, uh, at least for the past 10 years, one of the uh, fastest trends in uh, education. Uh, BYOD, uh, the bane, the bane of anyone in IT. Uh, when they were planning uh, the classrooms, we, we just moved into a refurbished building two years ago. When they were planning the building, they were planning the network so that uh, in the auditorium that had 100 seats, they could handle 100 simultaneous connections. Well, two years later, they need 200 because every student is bringing in a laptop or a tablet and everyone has a phone. You've got two devices per person. Uh, sometimes you go up to three devices per person. And you have the challenge that these devices are not all similar. They're not all using the same operating system. Uh, they don't all have the antivirus up to date, uh, but they all have to work together in the environment for effective teaching to take place. Again, another implication of technology. Less memorization and more sourcing. Uh, I remember in, in grade school the amount of time I spend memorizing the uh, 
Gettysburg Address and some of Shakespeare's works. Uh, uh, a lot of students today don't spend nearly as much time. The idea is it's less important to have the information on the top of your head than to know where to find it. Oh, and knowing where to find it means you have to have a device handy all the time. As a side note, uh, by the way, they've also done research in the last few years that looks at student use of laptops and tablets for taking notes versus taking notes by hand, and they have found conclusively the students who take notes on laptops or tablets learn less than people who take notes on hand. Uh, and the reason is that if you're taking notes on a laptop or a tablet, you're much more likely to transcribe. If you're transcribing, you're not processing. Uh, when you have to take notes by hand and you can't write every word, you have to process more to pull the highlights. That processing of information leads to more memory. That's a lesson we can all apply as we're trying to decide what do we want to remember. But if there's ever anything you want to remember from an, any lecture or presentation, taking notes by hand is the best way to move that from your short-term to your long-term memory. More problem solving. Uh, again, we regularly pay attention to the people who are hiring our students. Yes, they want people who are literate. Yes, they want people who can do math. But that's not their big need. Their big need is people who can respond to the unexpected. They want people who can think, people who can do analysis. Uh, that changes the entire approach to teaching. And lifelong education. The idea that uh, just because we went to college, we learned a specific skill, you can't stop there. Your field is going to continue to move. If you don't move with it, you're not going to be able to stay employed. Uh, the idea of going to work for one company and staying with that one company for your whole life, unless that company is Technology Futures. Uh, <laughs> I, know, I know of very few people who uh, can stay with one company. And again, this means more pressure on the system. The system has to be set up to constantly re-educate people. Uh, you know, I think about my father. My father was a tool maker. He could do anything with a lathe and a drill press. Oh, except today, that same lathe and drill press are operated by a computer. It's, and the, everything is much more exact, much more precise. Um, different set of skills. Uh, so anyway, so I made this list. And I took it to my head instructional designer and said, I made this list. And I'm going to go talk to these people. Let me know if I've left anything out. Uh, and, uh, Dr. Aisha Haynes, uh, my assistant director, said, Augie, that's a good list, but you've left all this out. I said, what? I said, yeah. You just trust me. So let's start with open educational resources. One of the biggest challenges we have is the textbook uh, uh, oligopoly. The idea that a very small number of companies buy up the rights to almost every textbook and charge exorbitant amounts. Uh, I, know, I, I know the economics. This costs $4 to print. They sell it for $50. That's not, that's not bad. The, comp the competitive books sell for $150 uh, or $200. Um, so what we have is a movement in education to find resources that you don't have to you don't have to buy a book. For example, I uh, teach a statistics boot camp during the summer, and I found online resources for the people in that boot camp. I've got to basically cover a uh, grad course in statistics in one week. And I found enough online resources where instead of having to buy the book, they can go online. I know, by the way, if they bookmark it, those resources are available to them. We have a program at uh, University of South Carolina where any faculty member can go to a librarian a uh, librarian will help them find materials that can replace their textbook. And if they do that, we give the faculty member $500 cash, just as an incentive uh, to move to the open educational resources versus the traditional. And some states are, uh, California has been more aggressive with this than any other state. Next is accessibility. The idea that we need to make our education available to anyone who wants the education 
regardless of any kind of physical ability. Sometimes that is something as simply as simple as having uh, books for the uh, uh, visually impaired. Sometimes it's having audio assistive devices in the classroom. Sometimes it's a special testing uh, environment for people who have test anxiety. And that is a real thing that impedes learning. If you address that, there's a group of people who succeed who would otherwise not be there. That implies technology, and we're using a lot of technology in that assistive thing. Um, all of you would do well to uh, do an inventory of your website and see how well you're adapted for people who have any kind of impairment, because uh, there are great technologies available to supplement any kind of online presence. Uh, mobile learning, again, the idea is that no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you have the capability of bringing in content. Uh, adaptive learning, I love this. Uh, if you're trying to teach someone math and you can connect them with a system that can give them information and then quiz them periodically, you can give the person learning at their own pace. Uh, in adaptive learning, when a person has a concept, it stops going over that and moves on to the next one. Periodically, it will go back and refresh other concepts to make sure they're remembered. On the other hand, if it finds you don't have a concept, it will go back and go over it with you again until you have it. The idea is using a uh, very slight variant on AI, and when we apply AI, this is going to get much better. You're going to have an ability to teach routine things like math, like physics, uh, in a way that people will much more easily grab the material. And you'll have the, those, those of you who remember the time, if, if you were ever the smartest person in the class, and it's why is the instructor saying it for the third time? That time could be spent teaching you another step and another step and another step. Adaptive learning, again, you merge this with AI, it's incredible. Game-based learning. Uh, everybody's trying to find ways to do gamification because we want to make learning fun. Um, this is especially important in places where students don't have a choice. L used a little less in college because we presume that uh, the students want to be there or they wouldn't. But uh, again, the more engaging you can make any experience, the more memorable the experience is going to be. So the gamification is a big factor. Again, VR and AR, uh, we have just started a working group at USC that's going to try to find ways to use VR and AR in teaching. We have somebody from nursing who wants to use it for anatomy, wants to have a person put on the goggles and look down and see a body and be able to reach into the body and with the haptic feedback feel the different things. So they can, uh, when you're training people in nursing, you can train people on a virtual patient before they have to touch a real body. Um, at the same time, the people in geology are using VR to teach uh, landscapes. They have a virtual sandbox, I mean li literally a sandbox with a few hundred pounds of sand and a Microsoft Connect device and a projector that will project the, um, oh, what do you call it, the, the topography onto the sand so you can actually see uh, from whatever the instructor wants to create out of the sand, you can actually see the shapes and add the things. With simply just a Microsoft Connect a and a projector. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, we have people in computer science in the group, obviously people from media arts. Question is, how do we use VR? Can we teach chemistry with VR? If I want to show how molecules go together, can I put on the glasses and manipulate the molecules and learn something? Uh, this could uh, lead to great advances in pharmaceuticals, by the way. Then there's AI. Uh, I mentioned that AI will help in other reasons. Any way that you can have any kind of analysis of what a person is learning, of what a person's strengths and weaknesses are, use that to feedback so you can customize the learning. That's going to improve the experience. Uh, we're not quite to the point of using it today. The closest we come is uh, 
We have a, uh, a propensity modeling program we use that looks at everything uh, a student does, uh, class attendance, grades, and uh, it's looking for students who are about to fail. And we have a group that's set up to, uh, we call it the Success Center, they're set up to intervene. Uh, our philosophy is simple. If you've been admitted, you're good enough to finish, and all those things, whether it's a personal tragedy, uh, whether you know a, you have a bad romance and then your dog dies and then you get in a car crash and, and then you have a bad weekend uh, and you get arrested for drunk driving, you think your life is over, we want a group there to say, no, we're going to help you through it, we're going to help you get back on track, and we're going to help you finish your degree. And we're designed, it's not designed to identify groups, it's designed to identify you. Say, Dub, we need to have a meeting. Uh, you know, our, I shouldn't say our goal is a lot fewer country songs out of college, but, <laughs> but again, the goal is let's use the technology to maximize the success of the individual. Finally, there are libraries. We used to think of a library as a place you put books. That, again, is a very uh, uh, last millennium idea. Libraries today are places that gather information and make it available in any format to anyone who wants it. In fact, we have a, a crew that's systematically going through our library, and they're removing the books. There's a big warehouse outside of town, and the old journals, I mean, half the library was journals, and we don't look at those journals on paper anymore. We look at them electronically. We still want to have the originals. And if anybody wants to see it, you make a request. The car goes back and forth two or three times a day. You can get anything with a few hours' notice. But that space in the library is being used for study groups, being used for computers, being used for other purposes. Uh, the library is going to be more important than ever, not just in schools, uh, but in communities, but instead of being a place for books, it's a place to gather for the sharing of knowledge. And the librarian, again, keep in mind the job of the librarian is not cataloging books. The job of the librarian is cataloging knowledge, making it easier to find the answers you're looking for. So libraries, undergoing a big change, and I expect we'll all be having some type of library app on our computers uh, or tablets or phones within five years. So that gives you at least 15 trends to watch. The underlying point behind all of this, in order to make all of this happen, we have to have connectivity. We have to apply the computing power. We have to apply the memory. And it's going to cause some fundamental changes in other aspects of society, including education. When we think of education, books and pencils almost always come first, but technology is going to be out there, and that leads to personalization. But, and this is the big thing, we have to make sure we are investing at every level in the education so we have the technology. The payoff is there. The payoff is massive. So, <coughs> got a few minutes left for questions or challenges or did we leave anything off the list of 15? Thoughts? I got a question yeah. on open sourcing in textbooks. I understand that market a little bit from what you're saying is a captive market. How does one get away from just total openness where there's no checking of the sources? This is the new book that I want to use in my class um, without there are better terms, what's the real truth? Right, speak. right. There are three answers to that question. First answer is the answer, the, uh, what I would call the Texas answer. Uh, Texas has a committee uh, that governs all the textbooks used in public schools in the state of Texas. Um, and since it's the biggest textbook market in the country, when they say this needs to be in the book, the books include whatever they say. So. Uh, at this stage, for primary and secondary education, you don't have as much access to the open educational resources, even though the books are a major expense. Higher education, 
uh, we have the issue of academic freedom, where an instructor has the freedom to use any materials they want, uh, the only exception being you cannot force people to adopt a book that you have written or you have a financial stake in unless you go through a committee that actually weighs and says, is that appropriate? So then it's down to the individual instructor. And we do have an insidious system. If you are a professor and you say, I want to adopt this book, you can contact Taylor and Francis. They will send you a copy for free. And if you decide to adopt it, they will not tell you how much it costs the students. So I've had before a selection of three or four books, and I'm trying to choose a book for the class. And I don't know that this one is $30, this one is $50, and this one is $200. Um, and their goal is, obviously, they're going to market the $200 book more. It's going to have more pictures. It's going to have more color. Instead of costing $4 to print, they're going to spend $6 to print it. Um, so the answer there is the individual instructor, if they choose, has the opportunity. The third answer is their number of states, uh, California being one of them in higher education, they're requiring open educational resources in certain courses. They're saying, we have enough people across the state who are doing basic uh, calculus, where we're going to put together resources that are not going to cost $150 a person. So, but you're right, it's, it's a very strange system. Um, Again, we're, we're trying the most subtle approach, uh, where it will literally giving a faculty member cash if they switch over, because the students are going to save so much. But you're right. then there's also the issue, is that as good as something where someone is very carefully packaged, made sure there's flow? You know, it's, it's a challenge. Are there options to just buy ebooks instead? I mean, do they still actually have to buy hard copies of every book they need? Uh, yeah, there are many options. The first option, you buy the book. Second option, you rent the book. So you pay for it, you have it for a term, and you give it back. Third option, you get an ebook and you can get a Kindle format or many other formats. The students don't like those. It, it's amazing. I, I thought about 10 years ago that we would be on the threshold of actually getting rid of the print version. And we've been doing e-versions of this text. I mean, for God's sakes, communication technology. We have a chapter in here on e-books. We sell maybe two or three electronic copies for every 100 cop print copies. And that's when it's available. Um, I think it has to do with the quality of the e-readers. Uh, there's something about the experience. Again, you students don't carry their books from class to class, uh, but they have them at home. They still mark them up. Um, they still sell them back at the end of the term. But yes, so the answer, yes, the ebook is a possibility. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is sometimes the ebook prices are just the same as for the print book. And you can't sell back an ebook, right? For a little bit back. <laughs> no, no, well, that, no, that, that's exactly right because you, you haven't bought, bought the ebook. E you have licensed the ebook. When you buy a print book, the first sale doctrine in the US, if I pay for this, I own it. I can rent it. I can loan it. I can do anything except make copies legally. But with an ebook, I just have a license to use that uh, for a certain amount of time on a limited number of devices. So, uh, the idea of ownership is really interesting in the book industry. Yes, sir. Marty, you seem to put a lot of emphasis on group activities. Is there any way that you can organize the group so it's a maximum value to the various members? Yeah, the, uh, the key thing you have to have is the people in the group have to have some pre-existing relationships with each other or they have to have a team building exercise. If you just throw together a group of people who have never worked together before, their first uh, half hour is gonna be just getting to know each other and what they do. And a lot of people make the mistake, they'll take a, a seminar like this and, now let's do group work. This row will be a group and this row. That can work if people know each other. But the key to that is the more people know each other 
the more they can work together. Now, the flip side of that is, in terms of effectiveness, you also want to have the greatest diversity of talent in a group. So in your perfect group, you get a group of people that includes somebody who knows engineering, someone who knows marketing, somebody who knows management, except your engineers tend to cluster together and your marketing people tend to cluster. So you have to artificially help people get to know each other to have that diversity. Uh, but the greatest strength comes when people from different backgrounds, different experiences can address the same problem and can communicate smoothly with each other. But yes, so answer group work. If you take time and effort to make sure you create the group dynamic. Thank you.